Just like that is what she said. That, it wouldn't have meant anything. Another commentary says, well, this could be uh, uh, red tide, which is common in blah, blah, blah. Well, guess what? Red tide is saltwater affliction. It's not a freshwater affliction. And red tide doesn't swim up rivers. It goes, you know, wherever. Okay, so that's why I, it, it frustrates me to see those kind of things because it's, it's saying we're stupid. We are completely stupid as students of the Bible to believe that, it, and what she said is right, it happened like this, and it's going to say that right here. So, I, I, oh. It's also saying, uh, according to some else you're saying, Aaron was acting on Moses' behalf. It says, in wooden buckets and stone jars, uh, literally in slash on the wooden things and in slash on the right. wooden things. Some think that since... The, the Egyptians believed that their gods inhabited idols and images made of wood and clay and stone. The plague may have been intended as a rebuke to their religion, just like you were saying. There you go. But in this case, if that's the case, then how did that red stuff get all over these idols, yeah. right? So th they contradict themselves in their own commentary yeah. if they're using that logic. Here's, <laughs> here's what it actually says. I'm going to read it without the... Uh, remember that anything that's in uh, italics is... Insert. So here's what it says from the translation. And there shall be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in wood, stone, and stone. That's what it says. It doesn't say um, the land of Egypt, both in buckets of wood and pitchers of stone. So what she's saying is they're making a commentary based on the Hebrew that we are inferring in buckets of wood and vessels of stone. Okay, But maybe it's on the idols. If it is, then that's a complete contradiction of what they just said. Because what are they going to do? They're going to go down to the, the Nile and throw stuff up on their idols and say, gee, you know, it, it's stupid. It's, it, it, it doesn't make any sense. So anyway, uh, you know, you could have had two different people making two different commentaries and they didn't check the work between the two. I mean, it's just, oh, horrible. Okay, go ahead. Charlie, don't you think it's because they're trying to find a logical... Sure. And I do that too. I do it all the time. I try to think what is an explanation that will not remove God from it, but God using nature in order to have this so that you can accurately explain something without diminishing the fact that God is sovereign over his creation. I do it all the time. But in this case, it says blood. So what you're saying is exactly right. People are trying to actually diminish the work of God. Instead of saying, look at how it complements God's work, it diminishes it. Whereas when I do it, I try to say it actually complements it. But here is how we can reason this out. Okay, There's a difference in my opinion. My opinion, I try to always uphold that God did it completely, 100%. But maybe he ordained it at the beginning of creation. And he doesn't actively do it. It's passively happening based on how he pre-planned creation. Because as it says, God doesn't change. There's no change in God. He set creation, and creation is the way it is. So how can we reconcile these two things? As a matter of fact, here, this, is, this is my question that got me thinking on this line. Is, you know, when I was in Bible college, in the philosophy class, there was a, a guy who's getting this. I don't think he's a doctorate at the time. He's probably got it by now. Very intelligent guy. Very intelligent. He, he reads something, and he's, what do you call it, uh, photographic memory. And he was talking about how God doesn't actively do something in creation. In other words, what happens is something that he preordained. Because, like I said, he created. There's no change. If for him to come in and actively do something means there's a change in God. And I said, well, what about the voice of God at Jesus' baptism or on the Mount of Transfiguration? What about that? And he said, that was something that God preordained before he ever created the universe. And some people, you know, at his baptism, or was it, it, oh, when he was speaking to the people and it says um, something, and he said, this voice wasn't for your benefit, but uh, for my benefit, but for yours. And then it says it sounded like thunder. But it was a discernible thing. So maybe God preordained thunder to happen at that time to actually made a speaking sound. I don't know. But if you think it through logically, based on the nature of God that we went through, it does make sense. But how do you reconcile that without diminishing the sovereignty of God? And what they are doing, what she's reading, actually diminishes the sovereignty of God. They're saying, it's just clay. It's not just clay. Even if it is just not real blood, I'm talking about with DNA and everything in it, it is still blood in the sense that it has the constituents of blood. Do you see what I'm saying? I mean... 
to say that it's actually blood means a person actually had to bleed out and it has his DNA in it. But it doesn't mean that it's not blood and it has all the constituents of real blood. So I, it, to me, there's a huge difference. And when you say it's red clay, that just shows how stupid the Egyptians are because next year they're going to think there's another plague, right? I don't know. Anyway, I, and that doesn't mean I'm right. So when I say things like this, this is philosophy. This is not, the Bible says it's blood. And we have to stick with that. How do we stick with that while thinking this through based on the nature of God? That's all I'm saying. And, you know, so I want to be really careful about that. I don't want anybody to ever say I'm not saying it was blood. It says it was blood. It was blood. But how do we reconcile that? That's my question. Okay. It's what? They drank the water with red clay, but now they can't. Right. I mean, exactly. I, I've drank muddy water in my life, and it didn't hurt me, but I sure, well, I did drink blood when I was younger because I got, I, I had a, a girl stomp on my face. I was, one girl, I liked her. Another girl didn't like that I liked her, and she started hitting me, and I wouldn't hit a girl. I fell on the ground. She stomped on my face, and I cut my tongue. I had blood all over, and what I did is I was bleeding so badly out of my tongue, I got to the, the principal's office, and the, this nurse gave me the cup, and I was spitting. It was just absolute blood in there, and she says, well, you want to drink that. You want that back in your system. We'll come to find out that's the wrong thing to do. But, so I have drank blood in my life, but oh, it's gross, too. Yeah, oh, boy. Gross. I'm surprised I wasn't sick the rest of the week off of that one. But anyway, sorry to tell you that, but it just came to my mind. Yeah. Oh, okay, please, go ahead. I just uh, wanted to make a comment. Okay. In my Bible, it has um, a list of some of the gods of Egypt. Right. Which is really very helpful. I like that. When you look at those and then see. That's right. Exactly what you said. I like that. These are the gods that God was refuting. That's right. And, you know, they, I believe, I may be wrong in this because I've never read the whole Passover cedar, but I believe that they actually say that in the cedar. He was sovereign over the blood, he was so or over this, or over that denial, you know. Anyway, I, I, I may be wrong in that, but I believe that they quote that it is the gods of Egypt that, you know, they're remembering 3,500 years later. But don't quote me on that because I could be totally wrong. Okay. All right. So Moses and Aaron did even as the Lord had commanded. And he lifted up the staff, and he struck the water that was in the Nile, in the sight of Pharaoh, and in the sight of his servants, and all the water that was in the Nile was turned to blood. The fish that were in the Nile died, and the Nile became foul, so that the Egyptians could not drink, wa drink water from the Nile, and the blood was through all the land of Egypt. But the magicians of Egypt did the same with their secret arts. Hmm. Okay, well, once again, well, here's what, the, here's what, here's, well, it, it had, but no, what, what it is, there's a pot sitting in Pharaoh's, you know, the magician's temple or wherever they did it. Pharaoh walks in, and as I said, this is what I was trying to get at, is that they, even today, you can make compounds that look exactly like blood. We do it all the time in Hollywood, you know, yeah. it, it, sure. and so they have the same chemicals that we had back then, and they are able to do that, so they throw it into a pot of of uh, uh, water or whatever, and it turns into blood. And Pharaoh says, well, see, that's not that big at all. The difference is that when Moses did it, the entire, everything turned into blood. Okay, everything that they touched, and he said, stretch your staff out over Egypt and the pools and everything. So there's a big difference in the scope of it, but the magicians are saying, you know, we don't know how he did it on this big scale, but we do know how he did it. That's what they're telling Pharaoh. They're certain, it's certain about that. Yeah. And so that's the difference because, yes, we can make blood. We do it all the time. Yeah. All right. All right, go ahead. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he did not listen to them as the Lord had said. And why is Pharaoh's heart hardened? Did the Lord actively do it, or did he passively do it by allowing those magicians to say, gee whiz, look at what we can do. So I, I, I just find it hard to believe that he actually went into Pharaoh's heart and says, I am going to condemn you to this misery. I don't think that's the nature of God. I think he says, I am going to allow you to condemn yourself to this misery. Okay? I, it doesn't mean I'm right. I'm just saying that that's how I perceive this pr really difficult issue. Did she have to leave? Yes. Oh, I didn't get to say goodbye. I hate doing that. Pick up That's okay. I just like to say goodbye when somebody does, but I thought maybe she's going to the restroom or something. So tell her I say goodbye when you talk to her. All right, go ahead. Then Pharaoh turned and went into his house with no concern even for this. No concern. <laughs> so all the Egyptians dug around the Nile for water to drink. <laughs> for they could not drink the water of the Nile. 
and seven days passed after the Lord had struck the nine. Once again, another specific time frame that's given. Okay, now. Um, uh, does that mean that it's seven days, let's see here, could not drink the water in seven days past the Lord stuck to, yeah, okay. Um, does that mean that it's seven days that the Nile was filled with blood, or does it mean it's seven days until the next plague? That I don't know, okay. I'd have to go to Josephus and see what he said, or whoever, I think it was Josephus that made this commentary. But anyway, it gives you a specific time frame there. All right, chapter 8. Wow, we're just smoking today. <laughs> then the Lord said to Moses, go to Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, let my people go, that they may serve me. But if you refuse to let them go, behold, I will smite your whole territory with frogs. The Nile will swim with frogs. So would that indicate that the blood is gone because everything... Yeah, I, I would think so. The blood is gone. And now, you know what? Despite not really liking this guy a great deal just because of his attitude, the naked archaeologist, anybody watched him? It's uh, Yaakov, uh, Yakobi. He, he's an archaeologist. He's Jewish. He uh, goes to Israel and he researches all of these things out. Okay, And he... It tries to defend the Bible. Unlike that guy, I think his name is Finkelstein, that's always just trying to say it's a just miss, and here's how we get around it. This guy at least tries to defend it, but he jumps to a lot of funny conclusions. But he did a particular series on the seven plagues, uh, or ten plagues. And um, actually, I think he did all the, through the wanderings and everything. But anyway, it was very interesting. It was a couple hours long. And he took natural phenomena and developed it into how all of this is reconcilable through natural phenomena. The blood would not have been real blood. Okay, had to kind of disagree with that one. But he went through, if this happens, and it actually happened in, uh, he went to a place and they, they got the, the footage of it in Africa. There was a particular uh, area where the water turned just as red as could be. And it was gas and the water came up. It ended up killing everybody. It, it, and, and he followed through. If this happens, then you're going to get frogs. When the frogs die, then you're going to get the whatever the and it was very well done and then he timed it with a particular yeah and then the the earth when it was totally black he timed it with a uh, uh, volcano over Crete or something that came by and how all of this fit then come the locusts everything and it was very well done but he made a huge error and we're going to get to it I hate to bring it up today we're going to get to it on the plague of the firstborn if you want to hear it I'll give it to you now or we can wait what do you want to do I'm now, okay, okay, we're going to go, just in case you're not here, we'll real quickly jump ahead to the plague of the firstborn. Anybody not want to do this? Okay, okay, all right, um, let, let's do this. I hope we're all gone, I hope, you know, but, um, uh, and I want to show you why you have to really think these things through. If you find the plague of the firstborn, um, uh, one more plague, uh, go ahead, where was it? I, I, okay, that's where I am, and then it says, um, uh, I want to, where it says what will happen. Um, so we're going into 12. He's talking about the ordinances. The 13 rise. Now, so okay, um, uh, it's in 13. I know it is what I'm looking for. I'm sorry, 12. Um, Unleavened bread should take. It's when he struck them. What? It came to pass at midnight the Lord struck the Where is that? 29. First 20. Okay. 29. All right. And it came to pass at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon, the firstborn of the Okay, so we're going through all these plagues and it was very, very interesting. I mean, it was just, and he did a really good job of this. And he, he came to a funny conclusion when he did the, uh, the tabernacle and the Ark of the Testimony too. So I want you to know, you have to be really careful when you watch people because they want to have answers when they do a show. And they will come to dubious conclusions. Well, here's what he said about the particular plague. Oh, boy, I make a poor Janice. She always has to suffer through this, cleaning this board. Um, he, he, he said that um, you have the, uh, uh, in Egypt, you've got uh, anybody in Egypt that has a firstborn son, okay, from the firstborn of Pharaoh all the way down, the, the firstborn son was always given the prominence of having a very low bed, okay? The other people slept, uh, uh, can't remember, I don't want to misuse what he said, but this is, this is the gist of it. Everybody else slept up on, you know, hay bales or whatever, but the firstborn son would sleep 
on this special bed that was a low bed that was made just for Egyptians. Well, you know, I have no reason to doubt him. 